Hello everyone and welcome. In this video sponsored by Qualcomm, we're going to look at what the future of cars entails and also discuss the question, are today's cars too complicated? To dive into these questions, Qualcomm brought me to CES 2022, a trade show demonstrating the latest in technology and innovation with a massively growing automotive segment. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, what does Qualcomm have to do with cars, you might be surprised to learn that they're already working with pretty much all of the major automakers. But back to wandering the halls of CES, it's apparent that the future of cars is not a continuation of the mentality that they're purely a tool from getting from A to B, but that they're an extension of your daily living and working environment, connecting you to your devices, minimizing the burden of driving, providing entertainment, and creating a safer architecture for transportation. Though if there's an inevitable truth to humanity, it's that for better or worse, change is not always met with open arms. So let's start off with a question the comments section is likely already addressing. Are today's cars too complicated? I want to focus on three major points. First, the maintenance concerns. Second, the cost concerns. And third, what historically has happened. Starting with maintenance, personally I find this to be a strong argument against the continual complexities introduced in cars though technology has also served to make this process easier. On one hand, as cars become more and more computerized, the requirement for specialty diagnostic and repair tools can increase. At the same time, we've never had more access to low-cost digital diagnostic tools, as well as very good, free online tutorials for how to fix our cars. It's also worth mentioning that the vast majority of consumers rely on dealerships and third-party shops for car maintenance. While personally I may want the job to be easy and accessible, the reality is most car buyers rely on service centers and the complexity of the job only matters if it means it's going to cost way more to maintain. So speaking of cost, let's get into the rising prices of cars considering all of the new technology that's getting packed in. Take for example a Honda Civic, a very common and popular sedan. In the year 2000, the four-door sedan started at $14,930. 20 years later, that same four-door trim's MSRP was $20,000. Taking into consideration inflation, at about 2% over 20 years, the 2000 Civic would cost about $22,500 in 2020. So the starting price of the Civic is actually cheaper today than it was 20 years ago, and yet with way more features, way more technology, and highly improved safety. So while it's packed with all kinds of new systems, the cost really hasn't gone up. And yet, new vehicle transaction prices are at all-time highs. As of October 2021, the average US transaction price for a new vehicle is over $46,000. 10 years earlier, that was about $30,000. So average transaction prices have far exceeded inflation. What caused this? Well, there are many factors, including costs related to limited supply, but also US consumers are buying larger vehicles and they're buying more luxury vehicles at higher prices. So for example, the most expensive trim of the Ford F-150 offered in the year 2000 started at about $30,000. In 2020, the most expensive trim started at over $70,000. So while the bottom of car prices have remained mostly in check with inflation, companies are now offering significantly more expensive models packed with features and technologies, and, well, people are buying them. Which leads us to the third point regarding the complication of cars. What has happened historically? Because truthfully, whether you're an enthusiast who wants a bare-bones car with a raw driving experience, or a techie that wants all the latest features, the overall market has been doing the same thing since its existence. Pick a car from absolutely any decade, say the year 1990. You'll notice a significant drop in features and technologies going back to 1980 or 1970, or when computers were first introduced in cars in the 1960s. Jump ahead, and you'll see a massive increase in tech as you leap from 1990 to 2000, 2010, and 2020. Cars get more complicated with time, because we come up with new technologies, new ways of thinking, new demands, and new ways of winning over customers. While it feels like it's a continuous argument that today's cars are too complex, it's entirely true that historically this has always been the case. Things advance, whether you're ready for it or not, and today we're in a really special moment where this transformation is happening rather rapidly thanks in large part due to the advancement in computers and processing technology. 
And after exploring the halls of CES, I'd like to focus on three key aspects of what we can expect today and in the near future. First, the digital chassis. Second, autonomous driving. And third, vehicle connectivity. The chassis of a vehicle is the structural framework that serves as the vehicle's foundation, the bones of the car, so to speak. But as we introduce modern touchscreens, cameras, sensors, and customization, Qualcomm has created what they're calling the Snapdragon Digital Chassis, the physical bones as well as the software upon which to build the many digital elements of a modern car. They created a demo of this technology at CES, with their processors powering the eight screens on board. There's an interesting challenge in the automotive industry here. For example, the average age of cars on the road in the United States is about 12 years old. So automotive computers need to be future-proofed for far longer than other similar technologies used in consumer electronics. We can't have cars that become irrelevant in three years. So the hardware needs to allow for the software to continuously change and keep up with the times. This also means that modern cars aren't likely to remain the exact same over their lifetime. When you buy a laptop or a cell phone, you'll get updates over time that change the product, if not the operating system entirely. That mentality will pass through to cars, and in fact for many makes and models, it already has, but it will continue to become increasingly common. It's important to note that when discussing these technologies, Qualcomm isn't trying to referee what they think is good or bad. They're simply supplying the hardware and software options and allowing the manufacturers to choose a la carte what features they want built into their cars. They can incorporate as little or as much as they'd like or scale the offerings depending on the trim of the vehicle purchased. And I think this is a really interesting time for car interiors where some companies are doing it right and others are creating things overly complex and difficult to use. Turning on your windshield wipers shouldn't be buried beneath three layers of touchscreen menus, nor should accessing defrost for your windshield. People like volume knobs and physical HVAC buttons, because with commonly used physical buttons, muscle memory means you don't have to take your eyes off the road for very long, if at all, to adjust settings. But things like resetting your tire pressure monitoring system after changing over from summer to winter tires, yeah, it doesn't have to be super prominent, and it's still a very useful feature, not requiring a physical button, which can be built into the menu system. Another thing to think about is that the devices in our pockets are incredibly customizable, and that's intentional. There's an overall platform in place, but ultimately the user is responsible for the layout of apps and how they're organized. Cars will begin to mimic this, allowing the driver to customize the layout to their liking. These interior changes become even more inevitable with a major shift in the driving experience, as autonomous driving and advanced driver assistance systems become the norm. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of wild marketing claims put out there in the autonomous space. So let's start this off with a very clear definition of what autonomous driving actually means. SAE defines this in five levels. For level one and level two, if you're in the driver's seat, you are driving. Level 1 means the car assists with either steering or accelerating and braking. Level 2 means the car assists with both simultaneously, for example lane centering and adaptive cruise control together. It's important to note that all of today's road cars claiming some form of autonomous driving are currently level 2 systems. You, the driver, are most definitely still in charge and liable for whatever happens. For levels 3 through 5, you are no longer driving. The difference between 3 and 4 is that with level 3, the car can request that you must take over the driving. If it requests, you must drive. Both levels 3 and 4 are limited in what conditions they'll operate in. They'll have their own checklist and only operate if that checklist is met. Finally, there's level 5 autonomy, where the car will drive in any condition and like level 4, it won't require the driver to take over control. For level 4, and especially for level 5, pedals and steering wheels might not even be in the car. Qualcomm's current goal is to offer their Snapdragon Ride platform, which is essentially an autonomous driving kit that manufacturers can select and use for their cars. They believe level 2 and level 3 systems will be the most popular through the 2020s decade, so that's their initial offering goal. They've already partnered with GM for helping support their Ultra Cruise, a more advanced version of GM's Super Cruise autonomous system. And again, they leave the choice up to the manufacturer as far as which sensors to use, whether that be cameras, radar, lidar, or any combination. 
Cameras are great for object detection and recognition, but they're challenged by things like fog and snow. Radar is great for accurately measuring the speed of nearby vehicles. And LiDAR is great for creating a realistic image of the surrounding environment that the vehicle can use for decision making, though it is currently expensive. I was able to experience Qualcomm's autonomous driving on the streets of Las Vegas, of course with a driver ready to take over at any moment, and an engineer in the back monitoring the status of the system. The really big question that genuinely seems to not have an answer at the moment is where does this technology top out at? There's a quote I really like that sums this up. Only humans are dumb enough to think that they can drive in all conditions. Robots are smarter than that. To me, it's not hard to think of a scenario where a computer would struggle to drive. Say you're on a mountain pass with steep drop-offs, no guardrails, thick fog and snow. Oh, and for fun, let's just say there's lava on the road. It's an unwinnable scenario, and yet we get news stories all the time of people driving trucks under bridges that their vehicle doesn't fit under, or through flooded roads which vehicles are incapable of fording. So there's this weird ceiling in the technology that has to occur where the manufacturer takes on the liability for their actions their car chooses to make, but also has to ensure that the vehicle is functional in all the scenarios a human might need it. In scenarios where the car has to choose between multiple unwinnable options, what's supposed to happen? We don't really know yet. This leads us to our final point on future technologies to be incorporated into cars, and that's connectivity. We already touched on this briefly in that internet and 5G connectivity allows for the vehicle's onboard features to be updated while the car sits in your garage at home. But connectivity will extend well beyond this in what is called cellular vehicle to everything, or CV2X. With CV2X, your car can communicate with surrounding vehicles, infrastructure, pedestrians, and networks, and can greatly help with safety, especially in the sense of autonomous driving. If your car is alerted of all the surrounding vehicles, people, and buildings, as well as traffic information and traffic-like data, it can use this information to safely navigate a surrounding, with far less dependence on predicting what will happen around it because it's already being fed that information. There are fascinating technologies coming into play in this space, and there are also very big, very legitimate questions as to how they might end up implemented. I don't know where we'll end up, but I enjoyed roaming the floors of CES to get a glimpse at where folks think this industry is headed. A big thank you to Qualcomm for sponsoring the video, and as always, thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.